we have blue seeds that are probably already passed. Everybody, I think, or is there? Where's the blue seeds are going around? There should be one blue sheet going around where it is. Okay, it's already passed in the end. So somebody could actually bring it out here in the front because I think there's probably going to be people coming in, not late, but actually on time. <laughs> then we need to have a note taker. We already have a Brian who has said he will take it. We take notes in the etherpad. So if actually anybody else would be willing to help Brian to take notes. Okay, good. Just, you know, just take it what, if you are having a discussion or something like that. Uh, so there's already, I pre-filled it with all kind of, you know, things out there. So it's actually very easy to fill in. You just see where to go or something. And do we have a chapter scribe? We do have people there in, at least in Mite code. So I think what, what we also coming up at questions from the chapter. Anybody willing to do chapter scribing? It actually would be interesting to have, a, if, if, okay, good, Paul, you can do it. Because one of the things is, because if you have, a, when we have a remote presenters, then we actually, can, they, I think they, I don't know what they actually can see, that you, if they might need to know what the slide you are on, because I'm not sure if they actually, does the Nietzsche host show, show you actually the slides or the person who is speaking? Okay, all right. Okay, so then we have a chopper's room and we have a Miteco and a uh, Etherpad. And I actually remember, remember to you know, update the <coughs> version on ITF numbers. <laughs> so here's our agenda. We're now in the agenda passing, logistic, logistic stuff. Anybody have anything that needs to be changed here or updated? We actually have, we don't have too many items there. We have uh, some items, but actually I think we should be getting this uh, done quite quickly. I, I, I don't think there's some, that much discussion. So if there's nothing else, then we go to rechartering, which actually is, uh, I would actually ask for our area director to comment on that. <laughs> yeah, hi, Eric Pajora, uh, area director. Um, so I have a draft charter from Nijelman, um, which got a bunch of IT, ISG comments. Um, um, you sent me a revision, which I think covers most of the comments, but not all of them. I'm gonna re-revise it to attempt to hit all of them, and then it should go out for a review. I don't see any, I don't see any problems, but, um, um, so I'll, I'll actually try to do that during this meeting, perhaps. I do a lot of my work during meetings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next one is uh, draft status. So we have uh, one draft that is uh, the EDDSA that is in uh, our RFC editor queue, has been there for a long time, and I guess it's because it's a part of very big group of documents that are going to be published at the same time. They are now in, at least some of those are in out 48 hours. I'm not sure if all of them are already out 48 hours, but it's it's going to be probably taking some time to get, to, I think there was about almost 10 documents uh, uh, in the same cluster. So it will take some time to get all of them through and, and so on. But it, it's already, you know, should be getting ready. Then we have the split DNS document that was, <coughs> Given to the ADs, and ADs say, okay, there's some issues, we will come back to the later for those. We have one that is through working group last call, implicit IV, and I guess it, we didn't get any comments during the, we uh, uh, but, but they were already addressed, at least, but we have actually, we have, have a redraft of that already, and this is like a second working group last call, if I remember correctly already. And then we have uh, this uh, uh, control resistant document that uh, would require to be Starting working group last I think. Um, Channeling Yoav, um, he says IPsec EDDSA is an auth 48. Yes, that, that document, but some of the other documents in the same cluster are still, I think, RFC edit. <laughs> it's, and I, I don't think any of them goes out before everything is out. Everything is ready. <laughs> yeah. So, and so the quantum register still needs to. I think we are going to be starting group last go very quickly after this ITF or something like that. Maybe or maybe, maybe even, actually, I, I want to actually read it before I start working group last <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. So, so then we have a um, current work. We have a script. Uh, these things are like what we have uh, currently today. We just discussing, and we start with split DNS. So, Tommy, if you can. All right. Hello, everyone. Yeah, um, I'm Tommy, and so this is a 
document that I've co-authored with Paul. We've talked about it a lot. It's the split DNS. It's pretty much done, but then Ecker gave some useful comments about um, some concerns on the DNSSEC language and potential um, misuse of this that allows a VPN server to essentially hijack and replace your certificates with TLSA records um, using the split DNS mechanism. And so we discussed this earlier this week because um, we do definitely want to resolve this issue. Um, just like an hour ago, uh, we have posted a update to the document to try to incorporate some of the thoughts that came up in that meeting. So we'd like to review them now and hopefully resolve things or at least decide as a working group what to do going forward. So this is just literally, I think, copy and paste from the new text um, that was in that section. So just going through them one by one. The iClients, um, when they're using the DNSSEC TA um, new configuration type as a request, they must use a pre-configured whitelist of domain names that they're willing to accept these from. So they have to have specific ones that they want. So for internal.apple.com for me, right? Um, you can't just put star. Um, so as we say, dot must not be whitelisted. So you cannot let the VPN server just override everything. And this is specifically different from what a normal split DNS domain would be. Split DNS does not, without DNSSEC, does not have the same restrictions. This is just going to be for the DNSSEC part. Um, so any updates um, half, so any updates of the domain names either must be done by the user or by having ex explicit administrative changes not being done in band with the Ike connection itself. So we're not going, going to be dynamically just allowing your VPN server to say, hey, I want to be the authority now for Facebook or something like that. Um, that is the idea. So this language should hopefully be a little bit more strict there. Paul, please. So, so, so just to clarify, this was to address the concern that Ecker raised that a mm -hmm. VPN server might be compromised and then send out new trust anchors while uh, it's assumed that your provisioning, uh, out-of-band provisioning, will happen through other CAs and other security mechanisms that it would not be compromised. Correct. Ecker. So this looks like mostly what we discussed, though Antarctica has, has had a second C. Um, um, uh, I think um, I, I don't... Is this done? But I thought we discussed um, you were supposed to offer this list in your initial exchange uh, as opposed to just filtering, which I don't think this says. But I don't, if you, ah, if, you okay. if it's invisible in retrospect, I'm fine so, with that. Well, that, that's also, sorry, I guess, Paul, you can clarify because you wrote the text. Personally, reading that, when I say we have a pre configured list of domain names, I assume that means that those are the ones I'm sending. But, Paul, you can clarify. So I didn't actually change the text on purpose, just in case we wanted to keep the option open that the client doesn't send anything because it doesn't want to reveal that, and he gets a list from the client. Okay. Right. I, if, if you're retro, as I said, a federal reflection, I think is inadvisable. Um, um, I think the only thing I would add is I think some text should go in here about like not, you know, about ETL, ETLD, about like not, basically about not doing ETLD. And I think, you're, as you said at lunch, I think something right. has to be a little wishy-washy because of like local, but like, I mean, really we should tell people they shouldn't be doing com and, and or. Right, and exactly. Things. So that, that's the one thing also that I thought when I read this, um, because you mentioned explicitly must not for dot, I think potentially just right after that sentence, we could have vague language about implementations should restrict this to things that are reasonably going to be internal domains. Like they, Internally, we could blacklist com and net and org. So, so Paul speaking. So, so I was I was afraid of actually speaking of specific TLDs because those things are dynamic and changes. And you know, tomorrow dot oracle is important, and today it's taken over by some we can internal. Not give any like examples to say that the implementation may also restrict any other top level or common domain that. But you already do that by not having them in the whitelist. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess. I guess. I mean, my thesis here is that like. There's a certain set of domain names which effectively are almost all are at the present generic, right? Yeah. And they are generic and not local. And those are basically the, the, the effective, the effective ET, you know, the, uh, minimum like the the, CC, the, the TLDs, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe ETLDs. And like, and like, 
the, uh, minus like local and you know dot home and crap like that. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like like explain to the user that the impact of doing that is effectively to like whitelist the entire internet right. is like something that they should understand. And like I'm I'm not saying I think I think like and you know it's it's true like that maybe you decide that someday that turns out that actually you did you know that actually you know you'd used dot you know dot apple and then suddenly apple goes and buys it or conversely that you decide no you really need to take over org but like serious thought should be given before you like take a tld and hoist it in this list right and actually a really good example of this practically in deployments i have seen many cases in which some configure usually not a well set up enterprise but someone else is going to list out in their domains a.com b.com c dot like you know they're going to try to hack the list in some way by listing ridiculous things so just saying an implementation should reasonably also not include things that are clearly just trying to grab the entire internet could be uh, useful they're not giving in not as a chair but uh, you do it all one of the things actually is that, uh, that we end up in, in every time every, if dot is very easy yeah. Every time you go below dot, we get problems because yeah. there's lots of things like the suffix list, for example, to, okay, which uh, CAs to allow or which are, you know, uh, subdomains of, uh, because in country codes, some of you have, a, some of country codes have two levels or one level or, or, or so on. And in actually, some of the cases actually might be useful to actually be able to take dot uh, foo yeah. if the dot foo is not signed. At all, and, and I mean, if, 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 specific if, if, enough. Yeah, because I mean, it, at one point, for example, when the root wasn't signed, you know, there was, you know, some of these countries had their own, you know, the trust anchors they were publishing and say, oh yeah, dot. I don't think for example, Sweden, I think they had their own, you know, uh, they were actually signing the dot se before the root was signed, and that they were actually say, okay, if you want to use this, you have to do that, and and okay, this probably doesn't go with. Uh, I think the country codes are not going to be that, but something below that is actually is what might happen. So it's uh, and. Then I have actually other question is for the because in Ayana we now have registration for this which says it's zero or more and that's actually one of the questions I gave with Paul was Paul was actually saying that yeah okay we could actually set an empty list and just verify it but if we say that okay you always must send a list then the zero is not valid option to send in ever because I mean zero means usually right. that okay yes I would like to get those back but you know. I don't restrict what you are going to be doing, but if, if we are now saying that- So okay, you saying always, uh, send do you it. want to be explicit about a list of one or more? I, I, but the question there is that, that if, if we are going to be allowing this, that we can actually send an empty list, we have, to, I think we actually need to explicitly say it and tell it what that it the means. empty list is not okay. It, um, it uh, either is okay or not okay. Meaning okay, meaning that yes, you can send an empty list and then you compare it against your a pre conflict files list and the reason you do that you don't want to tell the other end oh sure sure, sure, sure. It's with yeah. what what you would allow them to hack <laughs> and, and 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 that would right. be or you could say that you always have to say if you say right. always have to send them then i we have to modify our iron register to allow say that okay the length of this is always something more something than not zero right so to Right mm. So just to clarify a little bit, so so we're actually talking about stealing the delegations, not so much as installing the trust anchor, right? Because we're already binding the two. So it already means that it's not specific to the trust anchor, but it, it also means the redirection. So I mean, we could add text that says, um, you must not redirect a domain that um, that's not yours. And then maybe you should really not uh, take one that's not in use and then hope for the best. Okay, so yeah, okay. Again, I, I am not really looking for like normative text here, but I'm just like I think like I got, and since that's why I think I think that that's you know how we get to, to get past Turo's concern. But I think like I mean, what I'm trying to get at is we read this document, like mm -hmm. who thinks like okay, fine, I'm not allowed to do that, but I'm going to do like calm, right? Like that's I, stupid. Don't do that, right? I agree. Um, that, that's what I'm getting at. And yep, like I think I like, like a paragraph that said like the implication of doing anything which is effectively generic is that, like you're like well, this is the entire internet is like. That's yep. like that's, that's all I'm trying to get at. Yep. Yep. So I, text, yeah, I, I agree. I'll, I can work on a sentence for that. Um, beyond that change, does anyone else have any objections to this update to the text? Because then at that point, I, I assume once we go through this, what state does this go back into? It goes back to, goes back to AD. AD. Yeah. 
Okay, great. So, okay, we'll do one more rev of this, send it out to the list again after we wordsmith things, and that'll be it. And just to be clear, we're, we're keeping the text to allow an empty list to be included. Y Yes, I, I think we want to specify, and maybe I'll change the words a little bit to make sure that it's a non-empty whitelist of what you allow, but you do not, you are not required to send it and okay. advertise that list. So no concerns with that? All right. Then we go to the, let me see. <clears throat> Right. So, uh, we have next yes. Just clicker for you. Hello, uh, Valery Smyslov. Uh, uh, update uh, some words about. I'd like to say some words about update of. Um, actually exchange uh, authentic uh, draft, uh, not about update, but about uh, some issues that was identified. Uh, well, just to remind you what ICOX is, uh, uh, the previous in London, previous ETF, uh, it was presented as a mean to um, transfer large uh, public keys that uh, not only large public keys, that is a, a probably a primer, uh, primer um, uh, implementation plan uh, purpose of this uh, use of this exchange but it can uh, be used for other purposes uh, too so it takes place between I say in it oh I have a monitor here uh, be between I say it and I out and uh, um, so that it is encrypted using keys uh, that are computed during uh, initial key exchange as it's why uh, it can uh, employ like fragmentation, and so we saw a lot of issues with transferring uh, large payloads. So uh, this exchange must be uh, finally authenticated. Uh, and uh, in the draft, there was supposed a scheme that outlined here so that uh, uh, sign octets for initiator and for responder include um, ICV, integrity check values, from uh, messages uh, of IOX. Uh, and uh, so that we include only ICV, saves uh, uh, space on both peers because they don't need to uh, store, to keep uh, the whole messages until uh, IC auth takes place. But uh, uh, later, Scott Fleur and Daniel Van Gist identified some problem. So the problem is that, uh, well, there are actually two problems. Uh, the first problem is, uh, for me, is a minor problem. So not, not uh, gen gen generally speaking, not every AEID algorithm has a separate ICB value. Well. Uh, that probably it, it is possible to invent IID algorithms that will spread uh, authentication information across the uh, cipher text. But uh, currently, all the IID algorithms defined have a separate authentication text, so it, it, it serves as ICV value, integrity check value. So this this problem, I think, is a minor problem. But a major problem is a security problem. So the problem is that. Uh, some IED algorithm behave um, uh, not very good uh, in terms of uh, second pre-image resistance in case when attacker knows the key. So uh, in this case, uh, in, in our case, uh, we assume that initial key exchange can be broken by attacker who is equipped with quantum computers, so attacker knows the keys. And in this case, uh, the attacker can uh, Forge like OX messages is we use this authentication as described in current draft. For for not not in every case, but in case uh, the 
used AAD algorithm is susceptible to this attack. For example, GCL is susceptible. Uh, well, so this is description of this attack. So attack in the middle, equip with a quantum computer, break initial key exchange, so she learns SKE, SKA, and uh, if negotiated AAD algorithm is not resistant to a second pre-image attack, so that attacker can forge uh, like OX messages and change its content. And uh, moreover, moreover, if like OX messages contain uh, quantum resistant public key exchange, public values for quantum resistant key exchange, uh, so attacker can substitute these uh, public values with her own. And uh, the, bad, the bad news is that with some uh, quantum safe key exchange methods, not with all, but with some, as Scott described, uh, it is theoretically possible that attacker found those values that both peers calculate the same uh, shared secret and attacker will know it. So it's a classic, it, it's a modern little attack. So it is not good. So possible solution. Uh, the simplest solution is to include uh, the whole messages into uh, sign of that. But uh, it's completely towards this attack, but it opens a possibility for denial of service attack because uh, peers need to keep the whole messages that may be quite large uh, until ICAOS like, takes place and uh, ICAOS cannot take place at all, so it will exhaust uh, memory, so it is not good. Uh, the second solution is to use, instead of uh, whole messages, use hashes of these messages with some um, hash function that is uh, collision and second primitive resistant. So it's also a good solution for in this attack, but the problem is that we don't have, uh, in IP2, we don't have hash function primitive. So it is not uh, negotiated, it is not defined. So we need to define new registry, a new negotiation mechanism, a new transform type. So it it's, um, increases protocol complexity and uh, we'd better to avoid this. So the third solution possible is to use PRF with zero key instead of hash function. And uh, PRF is negotiated. We have uh, registry, we have negotiation mechanism, so everything is fine. Uh, well, but the small problem is, again, that not every PRF is uh, uh, resistant to uh, second pretty much attack in case when attacking on the key. Uh, but uh, the good news is that all HMAC based PRF are resistant. But some PRF, at least two PRFs that are registered, that are defined by IP2, uh, AES, XCBC, and IX, CMAC are not resistant. But these PRF are not suitable for use with uh, quantum uh, key exchange uh, at all because they internally use uh, 128 bit key and so they're not secure enough. So, uh, question, I'll let you. Oh, actually, I have a comment. Just to mm -hmm. One of the things I was thinking of, because what we are usually doing with the initiator signed octets is that we are PRFing it. We are calculating PRF out of it. And then we are, you know, if it's a, you know, preset key, we are using the preset key as a PRF. If it's going to be, you know, the uh, authentication, it's okay. Then we are uh, signature, then we are actually doing something else. But I mean, we are already filling them, them into the PRF. And if, the, if those uh, algorithms are not suitable for, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, for that kind of That's, operations, to be there is, actually, there is one I think there's Scott going to be probably answering to me already. There is <laughs> minor minus, nuance, uh, minor uh, detail. Uh, everywhere in Ike v2, PRF is used uh, in suggestions that the attacker doesn't know the key. But in this case, it is a little bit of a different situation. And uh, uh, Scott, as cryptographer, said uh, assured that some PRF behave badly. At least two of them behave badly. All each make behave behave good. Uh, uh, key make PRF that is uh, uh, based on Kitchak right. is also behave good. So most PRF behave good, but there are very few of them that are not very good in this situation. Right. So, yeah. Question? I think you dropped out of the queue.
I think you watched that before. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Paul Wouters read it. So, actually, at this point in time, we have negotiated or at least exchanged payloads for a hash algorithm for the digital signature one. No, yeah. it is not negotiated. It's just announced. Moreover, it is, well, it is not every year announced uh, the set of hash algorithms that can be used for signatures. But uh, after that, each peer selects uh, one hash algorithm among the set that uh, its peer uh, announced and use it in Ike house. But right. we need to know, well, we need to negotiate it first. We need to negotiate it before Ike house. There's no negotiation mechanism. And moreover, uh, among the list of hash functions that are currently defined for use with signature, there is at least one identity function that is not collision resistant at all. So it is not a, it's not, it is not an option. I was thinking about it a bit. So uh, currently, uh, the third solution using PRF looks like best possible uh, compromise. If you have any other better ideas, please, uh, you're welcome. So I'll update, update uh, the draft uh, shortly uh, after ITF uh, with this solution. But if you have some other ideas, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. So no comments about that? Actually, one of the things we actually skipped your previous presentation <laughs> because you didn't comment anything. <laughs> we don't need an update uh, present for that presentation because there are just two statements that uh, quantum resistance actually, is ready. <laughs> I agree, I still, I still go to that. Uh, you, you can tell it by yourself. Okay, I can, or I can just give you, give you this one. This was, a, this was part of the draft update. Well, <laughs> Well, for this presentation, well, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't know if even presented as needed. So, <laughs> so the draft just uh, has two changes from previous version. All changes are editorial, thanks to uh, Tommy and Kuhn. And uh, it's just clarification. It, uh, they didn't change bit on the wire. So uh, we still have four. Uh, in, uh, implementation that uh, that were uh, tested for interoperability, and uh, we believe that the draft is uh, ready for last call. It is uh, quite stable for the last half a year. Hi, uh, Jonathan Hamill from CSC. Um, Please forgive this late comment from a newcomer, but um, when I was reviewing the draft, um, I was looking at the, there's notify use PPK that's in, sent in the Ike SA init. Um, I was wondering what, why that is actually necessary when you send a notify with the key ID in the Ike auth, particularly by sending that you're enabling um, someone to, an attacker to profile which connections might actually be quantum resistant or not to, to enable them to, um, to store those ones versus ones that might be quantum resistant. Uh, well, uh, this identification is needed for um, support of legacy uh, uh, implementation that don't support PPK, so you, you, you can't just start using it without knowing that the peer also uh, is able to use it. But can't you just handle that in the same way as if the responder doesn't know what the key ID is? Uh, so the problem is that you, well, the draft uh, has uh, several uh, versions. In the very first version, the PPK key ID was sent uh, in AKC need just uh, in the very first message, but it has, uh, it, it has uh, much dis more disadvantages than advantages. First, uh, the PKD, well, it was, uh, if, you, if I remember currently, it was hash uh, of uh, PPK, so you, uh, it, it was bad from uh, algorithm agility, agility point of view because the hash function wasn't negotiated. So you first need to negotiate some uh, cryptographic primitive before you can 
uh, use them. So sending in a init, sending PPK ID is not a good idea, wasn't a, a good idea. So we decided to first negotiate using PPK and then send PPK ID in the uh, ICALS message. When, er, uh, when all cryptographic primitives are negotiated and you have all the uh, attribute uh, negotiated. So. Uh, so, so I'm not suggesting moving the, the negotiation of the key ID to the init. Uh, I just think that the state machine can actually handle it if you uh, just remove the use PPK notify from from the SA init. But uh, maybe I'm missing something. If, if, negotiate, if initiate it doesn't know whether responder supports PPK or not, uh, it uh, would send, well, in ICALS, it need to send authentication information uh, in ICALS payload. That is computing using PPK. So, while preparing right. this uh, authentication information, uh, initiator need already to know whether responder will understand it or not. Uh, but you, you yes, can send, yes, we you use, can we, send a no PPK. Yes, yes, it was introduced late. Right. Yes. So, yes. okay. so, Tommy Polly, um, right, that was the point I think I was going to make as well. So, with the current structure, if you do support the PPK, mm -hmm. then you actually are replacing the Ike off payload with the PPK derived yes. key. So in order to, if you wanted to not negotiate up front, because let's say I'm talking to a legacy client, I don't negotiate it, I don't have any confirmation that the responder supports PPK, they will not recognize the PPK, the no PPK off payload. They will look at the off payload, expect it to be yes. the normal yes. derivation, and they will not match. And especially if I do have an implementation that doesn't want to support no PPK off in the case in which I can use PPK because I don't want to support fallback for a case in which I can potentially have a quantum resistant connection, then there is no other off payload even for them to have. And so I don't want to necessarily switch the definitions of those. Okay, I, I see that now, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Paul. Stanislas uh, Mishlev, thank you very much for continued efforts with this document. Uh, I think that it's a really good condition, and uh, thank you for comments about the PRFs and the properties which uh, uh, can be or cannot be applicable for the properties you require. Um, can I ask uh, if there is some uh, actual and up to time version of security assessment of um, the uh, mechanisms because I think they are quite reasonable, quite secure. But just in case, uh, do you have any security assessments publicly available now or just uh, maybe in the mailing list? Are you talking about uh, quantum resistant drugs? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, uh, I think that. Uh, uh, Generally speaking, uh, I don't know, I'm not aware of any formal uh, security analysis, but uh, I think that Scott uh, makes some um, cryptographic uh, evaluation of the scheme mm -hmm. at, and uh, it is a widely known idea that uh, using symmetric cipher is um, proven to be uh, it's acceptable only to grow algorithm uh, in quantum computer world. So if we use symmetric cipher, symmetric, uh, symmetric cryptography uh, by steering in uh, PPK in a ski uh, seed calculation, mm -hmm. we seem to be uh, secure against quantum, quantum computer. Uh, yes, uh, but I'm just talking about uh, the issues that are uh, more or less about uh, the command you did uh, just five minutes ago, that not all paragraphs can see it's, the construction. It's about another draft. It's about another draft. Okay. So are we talking about the draft? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know. I, again, I'm not a cryptographer. I can rely on Scott. It's Scott that uh, assert that some PRF are not uh, pretty much, a second pretty much secure. Uh, in situation when attacker knows the key. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that HMAC and KeyMAC, or all the HMAC based PRF are secure. Mm -hmm. KeyMAC is secure also, but XCBC and CMAC are not secure. 
Well, I cannot comment about it because I'm not a cryptographer. It's true, and uh, yes, these arguments are perfectly true. And uh, I think that if some additional security assessment will be needed, I think this can be pushed forward to SafeRG and CryptoRG panel. I think it's a good way to go there. I think it will be a very easy review, but if you need. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Um, I just wanted to, uh, before we switch, uh, talk about time frame on the, the draft. Um, so uh, you would like to to review it? Uh, Actually, yeah, we we got. Uh, I can read, of course, review it during the last call. So, I the working group last call. I mean, so we can actually. I think, yeah, I think we are ready for starting a working group last call. That so we can probably push the button. So just push the button and. <laughs> I have to work on a shepherd right now. Yeah. But actually, we can start working group last call before that. Oh no! Yes. yes. So I think we're actually going to be starting working group last call for this uh, quantum resistance, uh, you know, draft as in a few minutes or something like that. All right. So what's next in our agenda? I need to check it because the last time I missed it. So we have we have post quantum key exchange for I. Can Scott is already there? So I switch the slides. Is this one? Uh, Scott, we're not getting any audio. Sorry, I forgot to throw on my mic. Uh, okay, um, uh, we uh, this is the most recent draft of our proposal uh, to actually to try to extend um, uh, IKV two to include uh, post quantum key exchanges. Um, uh, I'm afraid that due to do a technical glitch, our the most draft uh, most recent draft and only got updated a few days ago, and I don't know if you've got a chance to review it yet. Uh, let's go on to slide three uh, because we're we're going a bit tight, short in time. Um, slide three, please. Uh, or, or do I have this? The uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the quick pre the, the, just a quick summary to remind people what the problem was is uh, is we're trying to add key post quantum key exchanges to Ike as opposed to the previous draft was just trying to add in. Uh, a, a post quantum uh, uh, pre shared keys. Uh, we also want to do multiple key exchanges so we can do both Diffie Hellman, Delta Curve, plus the newfangled uh, post quantum so that basically we don't make things worse. And also because of most post quantum algorithms are tend, tend to be chatty, uh, uh, we have to deal with fragmentation because we don't necessarily need to be able to rely on TCP fragmentation. Uh, next. Uh, a uh, quick overview, uh, we've completely revised our, our, our ideas from the previous ones because we were, they were actually rather complex. We are basically going to use the, the Ike Ox exchanges proposed by Valerie. And uh, basically the idea is that we put the additional key exchanges within those Ike Ox and so that, and, um, and so that the final I keys we actually use uh, is actually going to be secure if any of the previous key exchanges were actually secure. Let's say it so that if even if, I, if the, the initial Diffie-Hellman was broken, but the next key exchange, which does uh, say round two is secure, then the final I keys will be, be secure, and so the IPsec keys will be secure. Um, and uh, all key exchanges are, are first are encrypted, except for first are encrypted, so that as, as Valerie mentioned earlier, standard like fragmentation works, and therefore that solves the fragmentation problem. If the, if the key exchange you really want needs to be is as big, then just do a just do a, do a say a, uh, a, a group 19 trans uh, ex, uh, uh, Diffie Hellman to exchange uh, exchange at front, and then use your the one you really want. Uh, next slide. Uh, this proposal, the, the pr protocol is actually quite simple. Uh, basically, we do the standard ICANIT, uh, I say init exchange um, with just some, some, uh, some post quantum policy attached. And there is a typo on this slide, this KE hybrid unresponded, that should really be uh, uh, KE response two, response one. Um, uh, basically, the, the, the initiator just lists, uh, does, does it's a normal uh, uh, SA policy in the SA1 and also lists what sort of, of additional key exchanges it would, it would, it would like. And responder lists which uh, 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 responds with which one it, it accepted. Next slide. 
uh, then basically uh, assuming that there was a, that they they both agreed on at least one additional key exchange and then then they, they perform each key exchange within a separate Ike aux method um, with each exchange uh, encrypted with the keys which have already been agreed uh, been agreed to with the previous key exchanges and each key ex exchange updates the keys for the next exchange. And then at the bottom, when we've done through all the Ike uh, messages, which might be only one, then we do an Ike auth exchange to actually uh, do authentication to uh, to make sure that the previous transcripts were, uh, were were not man in the middle attacked. And and then beyond that, after that, we go and and everything is is nice. Next slide. Let's see. Uh, for, format of policy, we put together, a, I put a, a very simple one, basically just list, uh, as opposed to trying to get fancy with and ors, we just list what sort of combinations you would would like. And um, if this is in addition to the key exchange uh, performed in uh, init, so that if your policy is you want to do ECDH plus one, just say round, round two, that, then all you need to do is list round two in your in your policy. Uh, ex next, um, this is a work in progress. We deliberately try to keep things simple because the work um, working group will uh, may make uh, uh, suggestions and and and, and add uh, capabilities. It was felt to be a lot easier to add capabilities in later rather than taking these capability complexity and taking them out. Uh, next slide. And my open questions is, A, do you agree with this general approach? Um, this particular approach uh, tries to treat classical and post-quantum key exchanges equivalently. Uh, do you agree with that? Um, so, uh, uh, one of the things we debated was, do we allow, or try to allow multiple key exchanges per, 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 per exchange, uh, just to make things more efficient? Um, how do we encode policy? We picked a rather uh, simple, dumb method. Is something more uh, involved, uh, appropriate? And also, uh, it was actually brought up um, in the previous uh, IETF that uh, key, exchange, key shares greater than 64K is a bit problematic. Uh, we don't see that as a problem. We just want to make sure that we all agree. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, do you have any questions? Uh, Valery Smyslov for this plus. First, uh, thank you for a new draft. I think it gets improved. And uh, actually, I like it. Uh, there are probably a few things that I don't uh, fully agree with. Uh, first, I have a question, just uh, out of curiosity. Uh, 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 you outlined that each new key exchange method has its own nonce. So is it, uh, is it uh, necessary for security? Or? Uh, I do not believe so. The reason we did that is we're really reusing an existing uh, key uh, update uh, that's already within IP2. And so since that requires a, that particular exchange required a nonce, we, I, we put it in there. OK. Uh, well, uh, uh, what about your questions? So I think that the general approach is good. So uh, I think that uh, second bullet is uh, perfect, uh, that we treat uh, classical and post-quantum equally. And uh, uh, I think that we should not allow multiple key, exchange, multiple key exchanges per ike -Ox exchange. Well, I think that policy negotiation, uh, well, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, convinced that it's uh, currently the best way. I still prefer uh, to use an IKSA payload for negotiating policy, but probably I can live with it. Well, one question, uh, is it better to send multiple notify payload instead of uh, each, uh, consist, each uh, containing uh, those key exchange methods that must be, uh, that are suggested to be uh, applied uh, sequently instead of uh, making list of lead? So it's just a question of simplicity and complexity. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that we wanted, we were felt was important was to make sure we didn't break compatibility with old existing uh, um, 
um, uh, implement IG implementations, and if we play games with what the what's in the actual the SA payload, they may get confused if we go beyond what's in the rules. Now, by putting things in notifies, they, they can just basically be counted on to ignore those notifies, and everything works uh, everything uh, works backwardsly compatibly. Well, I think it, it, it should be discussed more. But, yeah, okay. uh, well, uh, what about the last wallet? No native support for keys, uh, key shares. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. The real <laughs> reason, of course, is of course the format of the IK, uh, KE pay, uh, the payload that there's only a 64-bit uh, uh, six, uh, a 16-bit length field. So, um, of course, <laughs> there are some reserve fields right on top. So, if the, if the working group really wanted to, they could actually probably. <laughs> Send that to a 16, 16, 16 meg. I do not uh, endorse that, but it certainly is possible. So it is possible, <laughs> but I agree that it's, it, it's better to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might also be much. better to, if you have a huge key, a share, key share payload, basically slap that on a uh, server somewhere and make your key share a URL and a hash. Mm -hmm. Probably. OK, thank you. Channeling Dan Harkins, he says, uh, pardon my ignorance, but uh, uh, are all the NIST QRC submissions request response protocols? That is two message, one from each and done. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I, uh, be honest, uh, I've actually only heard of one serious proposal, which was not a submiss submission, which required a three pass protocol and we're ignoring that. Okay, I think that was uh, all. Called. I, I didn't see anybody in the line anymore, so <laughs> I guess we have a, a getting answers to some of the questions here. And uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so nothing else. Let's move to the next forward then. This is draft that is ongoing, so we are going to be, you know, working on this for some time anyway. So, but it, of course, would be a good thing to if people actually read it at some point. Yeah. Uh, meaning me too. Daniel already here. Okay, let's keep him now and let's go to the controller Ike because he, I know Daniel is in the uh, home net uh, making presentation there and he was supposed to be uh, done in the first 20 minutes, but uh, I guess they're a little bit late. One more plus. Controller Ike, why mess with perfection? Um, all right, so I started a few years back at a company um, doing SD-WAN stuff, which is what got me involved in all this stuff. Um, we're building things a little differently. So we're building very large full mesh networks. We do 10,000 nodes. And in our networks, everything is controller-based. So we push everything down. We want the end nodes as light as possible. And this is where we came up with this. So. A lot of work was done looking at how do we get the scalability going. I know some discussions have been done on the list, so I actually kind of try to address scalability a bit. Um, we're really not focused on how many Diffie-Hellmans we can do in a second. Um, there's a lot more to our scalability that we're looking at. How much memory are we taking up? Um, e even things like um, the latency of bringing up a, an Ike session is important to us. And so for us, having um, sessions ready to go after the controller sends you your um, information in a full mesh was important. And so that's where we've come out of. Um, other things, we're looking at SD-WANs um, getting more and more popular. Different groups are looking at them. And I'm seeing folks talking about doing key exchanges in a controller environment where they are sending keys through the controller. And that was something we really wanted to avoid. We don't want that man in the middle we don't want um, controllers to ever know what keys we're actually using to encrypt data. Um, and, and even in that, um, we've come up with, uh, there'll, there'll be some stuff on you know, future stuff uh, to think about where you could even have endnotes encrypting um, to even prevent a man in the middle from spoofing. Um, other things, odd shaped networks. We have networks that are sometimes links are one directional. It is very hard to do Ike in one direction only. And so with a controller model, we can actually set up a link where 
two nodes can communicate, though it's only one direction. Um, and that does actually happen. Um, so what is controller Ike? Um, the concept is really simple. Uh, you start off, you've got a controller. It's controlling all your IPsec nodes. Every node generates a Diffie-Hellman pair. They send their public keys up to the controller. The controller is going to send all the public keys for everybody out to everybody else. It lets everyone know. Um, and then, voila, we've got the ability to do Diffie-Hellman shared secrets with every other node in the network. Um, what else? Here, I mentioned uh, you could sign a message if you cared to. Um, in this, we've got no peer-to-peer -peer messaging going on. Um, so every, everything is strictly to the controller, and you're ready to go. Um, as it says, it sounds really easy. You could almost think you're done at that point, um, but it's harder. Um, what happens? So what happens when a, key, a peer decides to rekey? And this is where it starts to get fun. So if one peer decides it's time to you know, expire his key out, and this happens every, ever how many hours it's configured, um, he's going to send a new Diffie-Hellman peer, a Diffie-Hellman public key, up to the controller. The controller will distribute that out to all the other peers, but it never happens at the same time, obviously. And so now you need a way to make sure that you can do a clean rollover with every other peer you're talking to and not lose data. We don't want any point in that session where traffic drops or you know traffic can't be sent. Um, it gets even more fun then. What happens when all 10,000 nodes in your network are all rekeying? And this often happens. You've got multiples at the same time. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, Paul Artis. So question. So on one hand, you're saying you don't have enough memory to do mul multiple Diffie helmets at once because you don't have the memory for it. But on the other hand, you're saying you have the memory to store 10,000 Diffie Hellman public key pairs from all your nodes. So I didn't say we don't have the memory to do 10,000 Diffie helmets. Um, we manage our memory very carefully. So managing 10,000 Ike sessions is more memory than just 10,000 Diffie helmets. There's a lot of state going on in that. Um, you know, these are, these are things we've looked at, right? Um, there's some other issues we've had. What happens when you have a network with more than one algorithm? Um, typically in an SD-WAN environment, you've got one configuration for all your nodes. Everybody's going to do AES, GCM. Um, you just tell them to do that. But you have situations. There will be migrations. There will be situations where you have older hardware that has supports older algorithms. You want newer hardware using newer algorithms. So some amount of a negotiation um, ish, negotiation ish, needs to be supported. Um, do you have a question? Uh, yes, um, Queen Dang. Um, I think something I don't understand here. Um, so you have the controller who controls all the communication. So why do you need Diffie Hellman for? Because the controller can generate a shared key for two endpoints, and that would be it. And they can, they can communicate. Right, and that's kind of the whole point of this protocol is we don't want the controller generating the No, but key. the controller hold the Diffie Hellman share from both parties, so the controller can know all the secrets shared in between any, any pair. Okay, no, so Diffie Hellman doesn't work that way. The, the controller knows all no, the Diffie Hellman they, public values. It does not know the Diffie Hellman private or, or, values. Oh, controller is in middle arm. The controller can replace all the share and then can be a man in the middle and, and know everything. That's how it works. And, and as we that, that's how you need authentication for Diffie Hellman in order to, to be sure that you communicate to the one to the right person. But you have a controller who controls all the shares that can replace all the share by his own and then they can they can get the uh, he, he can get all the share secret in his hand. So as mentioned, you could have nodes individually signing their keys before they send them up. So if node A wants to send up node A's new public key, it can sign that. When node B gets it, he can verify that this was a key generated by node A, not by the controller. So, so the, the two nodes in the pair already have the communication where they can uh, vet a sign and verify signature. So uh, I don't know they what have, else do we need they if have, they do have that they have connection already. Connection to the controller, not necessarily peer-to-peer -peer in both directions. 
So you mean in this case, controller just passing the, uh, passing along the uh, the, uh, the the different human share with the signature on it to one party to another? Possibly, yes, absolutely. Okay, so so at least it must have signature somewhere in here to uh, to guarantee that that has been done. Um, otherwise, the controller, you know, has is this has everything in his hand. Okay. Hi, Eric Pascuala, Security Air Director. Yes. What makes this Ike? What makes this Ike? Yes, in what well, way is this Ike? It's a key exchange, and it's on the internet, <laughs> and that's an I-K-E. That's so, all it came from. So TLS would be in scope for this working group? Right. Um, um, so yeah, right. Uh, sorry. Let me make my point more sharply. This is out of scope for this working group, out of charter. Just first for as a chair, we take it here because there has been discussion on IE2 NSF about these, you know, things that are doing similar kind of thing. This was doing better thing than what they are doing there because they, what they are having there is that they have this uh, thing that the uh, controller uh, they have two options. One option is to distribute only the you know the uh, configuration, which is fine. Then the peers are like Ike. Uh, in uh, in the other option, they have that oh the is what what. Uh, <coughs> When I was saying that, okay, we have all the keys generated by the controller and it pushes them, which means that the controller has all the keys, which right. would be really, really nice for some governments and TLAs, but not really nice for anybody else. In here, it would actually be, yes, the controller can still do the same thing unless you out, have an end-to-end authentication, which might, in this case most probably wouldn't. But the difference there is that now the controller has to do manage the active manage the middle kind of thing because he has to change the public keys and that's one of the things he might actually get caught and he probably don't want to do that everybody you know just you know so so it's 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 some kind of things that this this is better that we are not this is not going to be in our charter not, not as as much as now but it's going to be something that might be interesting in people and that's why we took it here yeah it's certainly it's very applicable to IPsec. It's being used, you know, controller-based protocols are being used for IPsec, which is why we decided to present it here. Sure. Um, you know, I've presented key exchanges in this forum before, so thought I'd do it again. Sure. Okay. Sure. Sure. Um, I don't have probably presenting here, um, but it's not IPsec maintenance. Therefore, if you want, therefore, if you wish to, if you wish to actually advance this, you'll have to have this group have to recharter, or you have to form a new working group. Uh, and not taking a position on the quality of the work. I'm just saying, as a process matter, it's out of scope for this working group. Or go to NFS. Oh, uh, yes, hold it If I see something like NFS, I'm asking for your group. There's also a working group. So, what is this? Coming back to the draft, I read the yeah. draft. It's interesting. Uh, I'm, uh, well, I, I want to talk about whether it is applicable for this group. <laughs> just one question. So, uh, in your draft, uh, each uh, peer has uh, only uh, the only uh, private key and uh, so it uses uh, it uh, as its um, key for communication with every peer in the network sure yeah. so uh, and um, the peers policy says that uh, the key must be changed periodically of course so the key must be uh, must take place but uh, usually uh, how often you need to change the key depends on, uh, for example, how much data uh, you encrypt with this key. So in, right. in situation when uh, you use a single key, but uh, your connections with different peers uh, have different uh, boundaries and different load, so uh, the, 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 most, the most busy connection will uh, limit uh, the period yes. Uh, the key must be changed. So the, uh, it is, it is suboptimal. We've had we've had this suboptimal you know, this discussion yes. just recently, okay. actually. Okay. And yes, you are limited by your busiest connection. Yes. Okay. However, standard key lifetimes in terms of data usage nowadays are large enough that we feel our time based um, our time based um, time based lifetimes yes. are yes. going to hit first. But anyway. uh, bandwidth based data based is it, it has to be considered. You have to okay. have it bandwidth lifetime on every key. Okay. Um, we're going to hit our time-based ones first. Okay. Thank you. Yes. 
This is Linda Dunbar. Um, I actually, um, I do have a question for the IPSAC and me working group on this, um, because I do see your environment, because in our deployment, we have similar issue. When we have SD1, we have large number of CPs, and uh, we don't want to CP to do like a peer authentication for every of the remote nodes. And uh, uh, the, to be honest, the controller is under much, much more secure environment than those CP. Those CP can be a pop-up box um, in like a shopping mall. It's like carry not that important data from the network perspective. Um, but the CP does have established the secure channel to the controller. So when CP talk to other CP, instead of them doing peer-to-peer -peer authentication, like peer authentication, they can go to controller through this existing control channel to the other peer. So if it's not IPsec, it may be create a different name and IPsec simplified extra fee or something. <laughs> so really is is the environment when you think about it, IPsec was created between two nodes, they don't have secure communication. There's a man in the middle attack. Okay. So we had this I key and all those um, things developed, but in today, in many of those deployment, like um, uh, today um, in, in I2 and ISF, they talk about this device maybe is a resource constrained re uh, um, device, maybe it's a container in the cloud. And uh, for this particular node, they don't want this node to actually carry the peer-to-peer -peer authentication. So they want a the controller to be able to control it. Uh, it's true you're saying, hey, controller has everything. But the truth is, this particular particular device out in the field, maybe it's one hundredth of the entire thing. The controller carry much, much more um, information, or uh, sensitive information, this particular remote node. It's almost, I was telling Terry, it's almost like, um, your whole body is already there. You have that little finger. You put so much effort protecting that little finger there. So, so what you're saying mimics the deployments we do. Right. You know, obviously we'll have nodes and data centers that are highly protected, um, but our controllers are the most protected devices on that network. And there are a lot of devices stuck in remote offices. They'll be sitting in shopping malls, in you know, as you said, in a pop-up store. Um, so. Yeah, so so that's that's what I'm saying. Maybe not calling it IPsec because when you say IPsec, they need this kind of full um, protection. It's oh, okay. Uh, Quindang again. So um, in that scenario you just describe, um, and in his uh, application, the nodes have to do signatures. So that means in a constrained environment, you do signatures fine, then you do diffeuement just fine. In our, in our environment, the signatures we put in, I think there's something to be considered. In our environment, we don't sign the different Exactly documents. right. That's right. right. So okay, so, so, so again, so if, if you don't sign your different human shares, that means that that means um, you, you don't have to do you don't need to do different human because the controller can generate um, you know pairwise keys to distribute to different pairs and they can go from there. No, no, we have customers that want to know that. You know, law enforcement can't come in and subpoena the records of that controller. They want to know that, you know, there is no oh, way to get like those keys. Key. I'm sorry. Standing back a bit. Um, no, it's important. If, we want to okay, we want to know that the keys are only on those end notes. Okay, if you, a, if you don't want anybody to get the keys, then you don't keep the keys. The controller don't keep the keys. Either don't keep the, the different human shares from the parties or you don't keep the 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 that secret keys that you generate either one you don't keep them that does not meet the key, key hygiene you traverse the key traverse you but when i talk to you i go through he's the ad he's the controller so i go through him but he doesn't keep yeah. actually actually i think i will cut this uh, discussion because i don't think as as Igor Eckert said this is not really part of okay, our okay. charter it's actually it's not a part of our <laughs> okay. charter which means that we are we, we are presenting it here or giving a presentation here because it was you know no, would be interesting perhaps especially with the discussion going with a2 nfs and uh, people would hear would be probably be more happy if a2 nfs could go this kind of thing and not having the, the controller having all the keys yeah, understood. I just want to help because people might, might, might do a lot of work for wrong reason. Yep. Okay. Um, all right, I'll wrap up. 
um, you know, I was talking about what happens. We've got 10,000 nodes. Everyone's rekeying. Um, the work we did, we put this down, we put this together and started working on the state machine required to keep everything in synchronous, everything synchronized. Yes. And so it's been broken down. If you read the draft, things come down to four <laughs> rules. Sorry, <laughs> keep standing back. Things break down into four rules. Um, we've got four rules that define all all of the state, and it's actually quite simple. Um, what we've ended up with is a way of synchronizing very loosely. We've got, um, you, you can have nodes send their public keys up to the controller. Controller will send them out. They will arrive at different nodes at different times. Uh, different nodes can decide to act on them at different times. It, it all works out. Um, more details, read the draft. Um, what else? So just a quick introduction. Yeah, we'd like to take it further. I don't know what the right working group is or the right politics for that, but um, we'll be doing this. I know I2NSF is doing this, and there have been requests. Sure. Um, well, I'm happy to talk to you more offline, but I think, roughly speaking, this was a significant enough piece of new work that I'd be pretty, I'd be pretty, um, like, I'd be pretty, like, unenthusiastic at seeing done an existing working group. Um, if you want to talk about, uh, if you want to have, like, a mailing list and start, you know, start discussions and talk about having a boff, we can certainly have a discussion. Okay, I'll talk to you offline. But I just like I like to think I like to see things you know narrowly scoped when possible. Fair enough. Um, just wanted to you know a few things to finish on. What we described here is a method, not a protocol. We did not embed this in our own protocol. Um, it's suitable to go into the I two NSF work. It is suitable in other protocols, um, but it is really just a method at this point. Um, what else? You know, future considerations, but. That's for once we have a place to talk about this more. And that's it. All right, thanks. Let me go back next to next skipped person, which was Paul. People don't comment that they are going to be skipped. You clearly don't care about you know your presentations because when I skip you, you don't even comment on them. <laughs> this one. <laughs> I made a slide for you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so we talk about labeled IPsec. Um, I brought it in because um, the reason we wanted support for IPv2 is that it currently is supported in IPv1, and we want to be able to kill IPv1. And so this is one of the items that some people are using. It's not super common, but we have customers that are using it. And so we want a way of doing this in IPv2. So there was some discussion whether should this be a traffic selector content or should this be a notify content? And there was some discussion back and forth um, between mostly Tero, Nico, um, who am I forgetting? And Valerie, yes. <laughs> um, and that didn't really give me enough guidance to go for one or the other. So I was, I was hoping to, if we could have some kind of discussion and maybe um, give uh, the author some more guidance on what to do. Uh, so in the middle, yeah, the, the problem I think is that uh, everybody had a different uh, understanding what liability is. What's, what kind of liable labels you have? Right. Is there a hierarchy? Is there, are there, you know, just a number that you add there? But, and I think before we can actually, you know, decide or think about what would be a suitable way to express them in the, you know, in the packets, we actually need to solve that issue. We need to understand what we are trying so, to so, so I think it's a little bit more clarity on that. So uh, indeed, I thought that there was a possibility of hierarchy, but uh, talking more about, especially about the deployed use cases we have with uh, with SE Linux, basically there's no hierarchy. So you either match or you don't match. The question is, would we want to support other security systems that do have a hierarchy? One of the things I actually think, uh, most of the cases, I what I understand is that they have labels, and the label is you have you are yes. you, there is no hierarchy. It's just yes, a because and... be, be, because uh, the problem with hierarchies is that under specifying is usually just as bad as over specifying. Um, so you don't want to downgrade or upgrade the the level. So it's really just an exact match. So Valerius Smyslo for this post. So uh, actually, I agree with Terry that uh, currently the. Uh, what label is, is uh, a very moot term. So probably if you uh, give more examples and uh, more cases of uh, which, which are more 
more closer to real life use of labeled uh, epicycle, it will be easier. But anyway, anyway, I think that if if label is if a security label is presented in uh, in the network in the packet, for example, like uh, MSL label, that it better to be negotiated in, say, in traffic selector because it's a part of the packet. Then right. In, so the, so then, then it's separate notify below because we, we already have a traffic selector just exactly for this purpose to negotiate uh, selectors of the right. But, but packet. so the problem was that selectors have other properties, and then we have to define all those other properties of selectors. While we really only yes. are sort of defining a match selector or didn't match yes. selector. So it's actually mm -hmm. a really simple selector, not a full traffic selector. Well, that is it. Need to define. <laughs> if you need to support label to be safe, you need to define a new traffic select and and uh, define how to match them and how to how to use them. Okay, if you are just going to have exactly one label for them, it's very easy. You just send you know traffic selector which start and end at the same time. There is no narrowing. It has it has to exactly matched. If you want to say, okay, any label goes to me, you say, you know, zero to whatever the maximum. Of course, the question is, is the line labels, uh, you know, fixed length or not? That's the one question. Are they integers from zero to 32 bit integers? Are, are they strings or what they are? No, no, they're variable length labels. Like, like they're sort of string representations of, of things. Okay, then it gets a little bit uglier in traffic sectors, I think. Yeah. Except, but, but of course, you, even in that, you can always make the exact match. You know, so that's you know, it start and end are always the same. So, if I'm correct, I'm hearing two voices in favor of traffic selector type. So, who was in who was in favor of the notify payload? Was that that was you, Tira, wasn't it? As, as I, I don't remember what I was proposing at that point. That actually, okay. be, because one of the problem was that it, it, if it was think about if people are actually saying, you know, what would be, you know, the meaning of the label is also if you actually do actually actually negotiate or is it something that actually you just transmit saying, okay, this is the label I'm going to be using when I'm transmitting, and if you have some mapping, yes, then for that actually, the, you know, so, the so notify not, would also be okay. So there's not a negotiation, right? It's just a statement like I need this label. It's either I need this label or uh, I need no label. Maybe I don't care about the label, whilst, but I'll slap it on. Yeah, then I actually think yes, that notify would also be okay. I, I, as I say, it's 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 just it's one of those choices that it has, you know, some properties are different, some of them are not. Okay, one so of the good things about notifies is that it's very easy to ignore, which means that uh, if you try to propose it to somebody who doesn't support it, they just ignore it and return you a traffic selector without the label, without the notify in the back, and then you can just to, oh yeah, okay, so he didn't support the label, so it either is misconfiguration in his end or, you know, oh no, can I eat the tear down, I can say, I basically say if I don't, can't use it because they have no label, or I can just, okay, so they don't support label, I can just send anything, what my label says I can send them. Because I mean, that's in my end anyway. Configuration say, okay, I'm, I'm going to using this. This is the traffic with this label. I'm going to be sending to this IP sec. I say, and this means that he's going to be doing that anyway. And with all the traffic coming out there, he's going to be labeled that with that label. And he actually, the, the actual the labels don't actually really. It, you could actually do it quite easily with local, uh, if, unless you have a you know you want to actually match the labels on the other end. Of course, in some cases you have a security gateway, security gateway. Both of them are using different labels and they are just, you know, local. Okay, everything coming from this, you know, essay is labeled as outside party one. <laughs> and everything going there, it had must to have a label outside party one to be able to transmit it to that essay. But, and I don't care what they are using in their end. But, yeah, that's not the label that you're negotiating over the IP sector. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. just but, their own but, label. But I, mean, right, but I mean, that could be one of the cases where you actually you you could have your know, both of these. Some, some case you have a, you know some party who is you know you are some external party where you actually don't want to negotiate the labels, and then you have an uh, internal party. You have a you know branch office where you actually assume that there actually might be coming you know multiple different labels from different essays, and you actually want to them keep them in sync, but uh, then you 
you have a different policy for they say okay this part must match exactly or i don't care what the other one proposed but you guys still propose actually the label all the time and if it does other end doesn't return then you just continue so that's why actually could it so, prefer the notified but i i mean that's something that actually is best for i i said there's pros and cons in both of those y yes there have been for three months so that's yeah. why i'm here asking yeah, for more so, guidance. so you, I, I think actually it's outsourced you know i i, I don't think there's have been people actually you know giving you clear, clear out the you know way forward so you pick one and you know try to see what happens okay fair enough. <laughs> All right, so yeah. So just for the record, I will go with traffic selector then because that seems to be the more preferred way. Right. All right, then we have the final presentation, I think. Or did I miss somebody else again? Nobody jumping up, but they won't. So I will actually check my agenda later. <laughs> so Daniel, I think I saw him coming in. Twenty minutes from the beginning. <laughs> so, um, ESP header compression. You have the clicker somewhere. Uh, so this is a draft that has been quite uh, for, for quite a while, a while now. The idea is that um, so we call this uh, EHC, and um, the primary. Um, uh, the architecture of this draft is that we're building a, a flexible framework. Oh, that's actually easier to read here <laughs> than on the screen. Yes. So, <laughs> so we're building a flexible framework to compress ESP. So the, the, how it works is that we have a, a strategy that defines how to orchestrate rules. And rules associated with context can compress almost every field in the ESP. Of course, when you compress, you have also to be able to decompress on the other hand. So um, that's why we, we remain, we compress and we, we remain compliant with ESP. So the, the document defines EHC rules, EHC context, the strategy, and some parameter as I said to strategy. So that's the, in, in this example, we have one strategy, which is the ITSP, a few, cont a few parameters, which we called uh, the ITSP context. Those parameters are gonna be used to define um, which rules are gonna be applied and which parameters associate for each rules. It looks quite complex from here, but um, at the end, well, it's it, we don't have that much complexity. These are the, the different rules we apply and the different um, attributes we use. And that has to be specified in some cases. In some other cases, they can be directly uh, read from the essay already. So it means you don't have to specify those. And this is actually, well, the rule that has to be seen, well, if you say, um, if you're in, in um, suppose you want to compress um, so, something only in the tunnel mode, then you have to specify the mode. But of course, when you apply that, you can read the mode from the SA, which means just by enabling the compression, it can be done automatically. So in the case of a single UDP uh, session, this is the kind of um, compressing you can achieve. So you have the, the packet. Here, the rainbow ESP. And this is uh, how you can uh, pick, 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 just the microphone. And this is uh, they can't see you either. what you can uh, <laughs> compress. Um, so, I mean, there is a significant gain that can be achieved. Of course, it's a maximum. So. It's not apl applicable in every cases, but that's uh, up to what you can achieve. And now, just so that's uh, implicit IV is uh, on the on its way, so you can eventually <laughs> remove this. <laughs> <laughs> so, but so the primary motivation was for IoT devices, but we also find it useful for uh, standard VPN. 
So for a standard VPN, these are some of the parameters you can um, um, configure and provide. And still you achieve um, 32 bits. Well, you, it's an IPv6, and so. But uh, no, no bits, bytes. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of um, significant, even, uh, even in a non-IoT use case. So, well, this one hardly fit into the slide, and this one is completely <laughs> integrated into the slide, so. And again, you can remove this <laughs> since a few minutes. So, um, compression may not apply at all. So, well, we were almost done until someone raised an issue that, yeah, if we can't compress the packet, how do we signal that? So, for example, when you have a fragmentation or UDP option, you don't really know how to compress and decompress those. So you basically have to send an information saying, yeah, this packet is not compressed. So don't apply uh, security policies. So how you we could, this is the, I think that's the only update from the, uh, of this draft, is that so we had two solutions. Well, two solutions we envisioned. One, which is adding a special bit, so usually that's a byte, uh, that says don't compress. And the other one was uh, reducing an existing field. So could be protocol or an X header. But um, we, we just realized how many there are left and um, said, well, maybe not a good idea. So the remaining uh, thing we had was the SPI. Um, and the SPI means that, well, you have a 2SA, one is just for compressed and one for uncompressed. So, well, it seems to, to kind of work now. And um, so we have 2SA, uh, one for the compressed traffic and one for the uh, non-compressed. Um, so we have um, an, a new IPsec mode, uh, which is um, EHC compress, but that's uh, most, most, mostly being used um, when you agree, because when you negotiate your SA, you have to agree then, are you gonna uh, use a compress mode and so on. So the discussion we have now uh, or more, should we use an additional mode which is EHC compressed, or should we just uh, provide the strategy we are using. In our case, there is only one, but in the future, there might be additional ones. So, and once you pick up, it's going to be automatically compressed. So that's, um, but I think that's more related to the Ike negotiation of uh, this um, header compression. Um, but I think so far, um, that's the only thing we, we have discussed um, during the last ITF. So the current status is that we have the two drafts almost ready in, in our view. Um, we had uh, one publication of um, an implosion on Kentucky. And um, well, we should have another implementation on Riot, but um, this should has been a, a shoot for two years because anytime we had the student <laughs> leaving, but before the project starts, so it's not because of the project. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where we are. So one one implementation, one um, academic publication, and um, a draft that has been evolving through different comments and review we have received so far. And um, so I think we're ready for adoption and ready to reach the milestone for November. So I think the the one snag is we're we're waiting on the charter to be approved. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think it would be better to wait for that before we actually start adopting you know yeah, drafts yeah. that are in the new charter because it might be the ISG suddenly decides that oh no no we don't allow this kind of work <laughs> happening. Right. I think question. Tommy Polly Apple. Yeah. Just a question. Could you go back a slide or so? Right. So. I, I do like the solution that you chose here. Um, I like the idea of a new IPsec mode 
for this. I think that works quite well. Um, has that been added yet to the Ike document? Um, I How we negotiate that? I think so. Um, on the previous version, for sure, um, I, pro I had um, a EHC strategy, mm -hmm. so which means I could have a list a notify payload, and then you, when you select one. Um, but this would be a property of the child essay, yeah. right? And so if I wanted multiple, I would need multiple child essays. I would essentially yeah. have my compression child essay and my non-compressed child essay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so just for notify payload. It would be in, like we have for transport yeah. mode? Or compression. Yeah. Yeah. It's Trans just, actually, transport, yes. Transport. It's, it's yeah. just like the one for use transport mode. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, so I, I like that a lot. As far as deploying this, if we know we're in a situation in which we're not going to be allowing IP fragmentation and we're not going to be using UDP options, it would be reasonable to only negotiate the compressed child essay, correct? Yeah. Like it, it is optional to have two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just may drop packets and take that into your own hands. Actually, yeah. one of the things you can also do you can create the other essay when you first time see a bucket having UDP option and so, oh, that triggered. You, you can, can do that on sending, you, can you can't do that on receiving. No, no, but the but, other, side but, but yeah. other one will yeah, create yeah. it. So, so, I mean, either right. one can create the essay for first send time. Send an acquirer, see, essentially. When they, when they see the bucket, they can compress, they can actually, you know, send the acquirer yeah, up exactly. and create a new essay for non compressed traffic. Great, okay, so I th that, that would be good to, uh, if that's yeah. not mentioned already in that document, yeah, like talk about that kind of workflow dynamically, like hey, if you are mainly thinking you're going to just do compressed, start with that and then maybe add an extra child to say if you need it. Okay, right. Yeah, we can add that wherever it is. Ladies and gentlemen, well, uh, it's a good idea to have two SA, but uh, there is one drawback in it to perform uh, difficult wise and since you are trying to know, uh, child I essay. You don't have to do. You don't so, have so to. you have the same keys. Hmm? I don't uh, know. I mean, it's 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 a child essay. Child child, essay yeah, yeah, yeah. So child you, essay, you, yes, you don't have to do the Phil money in every child essay. Wow, you can. You can do in great <laughs> child essay if you want well, to, anyway, have to, but you don't have to. Anyway, the uh, the other thing is that you usually uh, make sure it's only one child essay in Ike out. So you, you anyway you need to perform great child essay with all this. Well, anyway, it's uh, more computing resource. You save uh, bandwidth, but you spend more computer resources on exchange in USA. Yeah, so and um, with different keys. Yeah, okay. the um, currently the focus was to reduce the bandwidth, mm -hmm. um, because I, I think the um, it's around. Um, I mean, if you send one byte more, it's a uh, ten thousand mm -hmm. time more than uh, the computation. Uh, um, the computation costs much less than sending an additional byte. But probably um, it's but possible to avoid. Yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, just you... using the same keys with different, with two different SPIs. No? So using the Did same keys. Did you consider the... this? But so the, the DFL man would be for the Ike negotiation, the first one. Yeah. No, no. Yes, but, but just uh, uh, supply additional SPI for this essay for use in compressed so you will have, well, it's just an idea. It's yeah, right. yeah, 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 no, 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 but um, uh, So the argument, you can't use the exact same keys because I mean the uh, sequence numbers and so on needs to be different for you. I mean, otherwise you have a, a non collisions and so on. But you could of course run the, you know, key mat twice to generate mm -hmm. two different, but then you need to have something different that you have the SPI, I think you have SPI there if I remember correctly. But I think actually it's much cleaner to just to do a create child. They say create child is just to, a pocket exchange and it doesn't need to do diffie hellman yeah so right. the diffie hellman I, I understand that we may not need well, well we yeah. might do that too twice but um it's not necessary that that we use exactly the same keys for the two is um <laughs> all right is it a renegotiation <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then we go to the next one, which is open discussion. I have at, at least one item for myself. So bring coffee there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the document, not working as not uh, as a working group chair, but an individual. So I posted the 
email a couple of days ago about adding these uh, or allocating numbers for you know and numbers for uh, twelve thousand and sixteen thousand uh, bit uh, groups for mod B. And the reason I am actually asking for what, what to get your feedback because I'm a little bit you know this kind of uh, conflict there because I'm working group chair I'm AD I'm Ayana expert <laughs> and I'm probably one who's going to be writing the draft and if, or RFC if there is going to be one so I want to know if there's any other people who are actually think this is a good idea or a bad idea before I just go and do it myself or should I just ignore it so that the reason there is I sent it in the email list and the re most bigger biggest reason is that there is you know, people say, oh, we need to have a SHA, we need to have a 256 bit security because of the Compton computers. They don't know what the 256 is, except that it's a number. And they know, oh, 256, oh, AES 256 fills that one. SHA 2512 fills that one. Mod P, okay, we don't have any Mod P that fills that one. We have a 8,000 bits, which is 200 bits, not enough. 16,000 would be enough, but we don't have that one as an iron number. We have generated the groups when we created the old, you know, uh, extra allocated, uh, extra uh, mod P groups, but we didn't include them there because it, I think at that time it was about 30 seconds to do it. Now it's about half a second. So it actually would be actually doable to do, use it in some cases when you have, not when you have, you know, a thousand customers, but if you have a site to site VPN, you know, with one VPN link, then you can actually do it. Even if that, of course, there's a issues with fragmentation of the bucket, but okay, site to site VPN will usually have a good internet and not behind NATs and not behind captive portals or anything like that, that would so, uh, destroy fragments and so on. So do people think it is a good idea, bad idea? What should I do? Paul pa Vargas? Um, I think it's okay, um, as long as there's a really good instruction in the document to say, do not add this to your list of default proposals, because we know that some implementations add everything they implement to their proposals, which leads to, you know, giant explosion of of, uh, of components. And it will indeed lead to like, oh, let's use the highest number because that must be the most secure. And then you're actually running this everywhere instead of only in those cases you want to. But, uh, and I'm, I'm willing to help you with the document too. Uh, Daniel Van Geest, I Sarah. If you're just doing this to check a box for this is safe against quantum computers, it's kind of a false sense of security because <clears throat> those are not necessarily safe. No, I don't think actually it's a false sense of security because it actually do offer you 256 bits of security. The difference is that with quantum computers, none of our board piece or elliptic curves is safe. I mean, the reason why you actually would require 256 is false the reason that, that, that this fact that it actually do provide 256 bits of security is uh, valid. D does the Diffie-Hellman provide 256 bits of quantum security though as well? I don't No, no, no. I, I mean, none of the, none of the, the I version 2 doesn't provide, uh, you know, I, I, we don't know how much, how many bits of security it provides when you have a quantum computer currently. Right. So, 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 so the, none of the security uh, requirements we have is valid for that. No, I know. So if we're saying that this does provide 256 bits of quantum security and they're just, but we don't actually know that it No, no, does. We, we, say, we say it provides 200, 256 bits of security when you don't have a quantum computer. Okay, but if they're checking the box that they want this in case of a quantum computer, then they're checking a box. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're actually, no, they're checking their box 256 bits it's of security. They don't actually care. Okay, most if that's of the, the case, most of then... the times they don't they don't understand the reason why it's why oh. why two five six is better than you know why why two five why NIST for example or some people actually say that you must be able to do two five six okay. they usually don't say that you have to do it they say that you must be able okay that's fine I'm, because one, just... one of the, this is actually one of the reasons we were actually in in fifteen four. As we are running out of time, but 15.4, we have we are, have now working this uh, stuff of in IEEE. Oh, we need to add AS256 CCM to the spec because 256 is required for some uses. Some governments or something required that everything must be able to do. No, no, you're not sure. Just when you were talking here, you said because they're scared of quantum computers. Yeah. And no, no, that's the requirement for somebody gave them. Somebody said 256 big, 256. And the reason they, somebody said 256 is the quantum computers, but the requirement is just 256 usually. Okay. 
Valery Smyslov, LS Plus. I think it's okay if we define this uh, new MOTP groups just for formal reasons, as you described. I'm not sure if they are really useful, but let, let them be. Well, why not? I just want to say that uh, the public key exponents uh, for these um, groups are huge, quite huge. They exceed uh, typical um, packet, IP packet size uh, and uh, they probably will cause fragmentation and uh, it will make using them, them in real life in, in some, at least in some uh, circumstances, uh, a little bit difficult let's let's say so so but anyway let's let's define them why not all right so i have a, s a small different topic if you're done with this okay uh, Paul is read it um so i also have a case where um, um customers want to roll out IPsec, but they, they find authentication a little bit hard to do. So they first go like, but let's do mutual null first and roll that out. And then later on, they want to update to use certificates, other things, and then uh, and, and do authenticate it. So now you've got this, this cloud structure that has all these auth null nodes that are talking to each other. And then you slightly want to upgrade them whenever you configure new nodes to have, like, say, a certificate. So what we ended up doing is doing the same trick that is used in the, in the no PPK case where we basically send a second auth payload, one with a certificate and one for auth null, and then the other side can pick, like, oh, yeah, since we both seem to be uh, supporting authenticated, we can just bump our connection from auth null to authenticated. So we've done this, we've implemented this, and it's working. The question is, um, we're sort of squatting on a private use number, should we just put this in a draft and push it out and allocate a number for it? Anyone interested in that solution? Uh, oh, can you please uh, bring this to the list? Sure. Uh, yeah. Because it's uh, it's easy to read and to think, uh, read and test. Tommy, Polly, Apple. That sounds in interesting enough. I guess the one concern that I'm trying to think of here is would having that other option potentially encourage people to use the wrong one? Like, would could someone end up choosing the null off instead if they don't know what they're doing? Like, that's true, <laughs> right? Right, but like by doing this, like, should we be advertising to people or encouraging? Should we, should we be making it easier to deploy null authentication for Ike rather than just saying? guys figure out how to do authentication. I understand how for your use case, that's it makes sense right now, but is that something that we want to keep encouraging long-term or making easy? Right. <laughs> yeah, so I think we all want to take that to the list. So maybe you could summarize. Yeah. Okay. I think we still have a couple more. No, we're over. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll we'll end it here. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will uh, work on getting the minutes posted uh, as soon as possible. So thank you. And thanks for the note keepers and so on. Thank mm -hmm. you.